we'll run with that. Thanks, Jared. Good morning, and I guess since we've all been together, uh, a belated Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and welcome to, welcome back to our big confirmation class, where conveniently, we are studying the Ten Commandments, which is the sermon series we're going through. Those don't always line up. As a matter of fact, in the six years I've been teaching this class, they have never lined up. So this is just wonderful. Um, if you didn't check your email this week, Pastor Aaron is downstairs teaching adult Bible study because Pastor Dan is out of town on some thing that pastors do. Uh, so Aaron asked me uh, to cover, and today we are studying uh, the fourth commandment, which, uh, if you didn't pick up the sheets on the way in, there's to Ruth. Uh, if you have a copy of your small catechism, which I do not because I do not have a fancy copy of the fancy new small catechism, but Ruth does because Ruth has her own copy of the fancy new small catechism. Uh, the questions and answers for the textbook follow along start on page 81, and we'll get into those for in a bit. Uh, usually, Pastor Aaron starts the class with a video, but because Pastor Aaron is downstairs teaching the adult class, I don't have a video. So you're stuck with me. My deepest and sincerest apologies. <clears throat> that said, uh, if you've attended uh, Sunday morning church during the last couple weeks, where we normally say the creed, uh, we have been instead reciting what we believe is God's will for our lives. What is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. What is the second commandment? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And then you just kind of dig into these explanations. So we're going to do something very similar today, but we're not going to go through all ten. We are just going to read right at the top of the sheet here uh, the fourth commandment, what the fourth commandment is, and the what does this mean together. These are the keys to uh, really just wholesome living. Uh, these aren't unique, and I think this is important. The Ten Commandments, I think it's really easy to get caught up in them and say they are just rules for life, and no one else worries about this. But when we look at the Ten Commandments, we understand that they are God's will, not just for our lives, but for everyone's lives. And most of them, except for maybe the first three, which are specifically God-related, pretty much four through ten, everyone in the world agrees on, because there is an underlying moral law that drives our human interaction. So when we read this, I want you to bear in mind that this is not talking just about you. This is talking about everyone. Your parents, your friends, your cousins, me, even, and Ruth. Maybe not Ruth. Um, Ruth gets absolute freedom. So, at the top, we're going to read the bolded, uh, just before it says consider this, and we'll dive in to exploring the fourth commandment. So, the fourth commandment, together, honor your father and mother. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. So it's really interesting. Honor your father and mother. So, what, six words? And then we hear the word honor, and what does honor mean? Um, as a verb, like you hear it, I have honor, I am a man of honor. But to honor something as a verb isn't something we use very often. It's not common talk. And so then, when asked, what does this mean, Martin Luther answers, 
We should fear and love God so that let's use a lot more than six words. He has a bigger deal. We're going to dig into why that is. Because every commandment, you shall not murder, there's a counterpart. Instead of murdering, what do you do? You shall have no other gods. Instead of having other gods, what do you do? Martin Luther answers this question. He says, here's what you should not do. And he also says, here's what you should do. This is what honoring your father and mother looks like. So, this is the fun part, because there are parents in the room today, which is always the best for this commandment. True or false, parents have the most important job in the world. Are there, is there anyone with their parents sitting right next to them who wants to say false? <laughs> is there anyone whose parents couldn't make it this morning, or who are now parents themselves, and, their, and the kids' grandparents aren't here to contradict you, who want to say, eh, it's not a big deal? Anyone? So, why do you think this is true? Why is a parent's job the most important in the world? Yeah, Zoe, go ahead. I can burn you off in the, in the right way and make sure you're a good person. All right, so they need to bring you up. This table is in my way, but we're going to deal with it. Okay. What what else is the job of a parent? Cat. Teach or pass on, and I'll get to this idea in a second. What else do parents do? Live as examples. Live as examples. Uh, my ninth graders, because that's uh, the group I normally work with, 
Uh, we talked about this a, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the idea of submission and authority in human relationships that we hear the term submit and we instantly recoil. We're like, I'm not comfortable with that. I have my own freedom. And yet, the noun form of the verb submit is submission, to be underneath the mission. And parents, you get to lead your kid. And kids, you should follow. You will learn this as you get older. I'm 31 and still learning it when I'm talking to my mom. But they are underneath your mission in life, where you are going, where you are driving, where God is leading you. Your parents are there to be submissive, not to you, but to God's call, to support like a foundation on which a house is built, that you would be strong. So I think for parents, I'm going to say this really quick. Food, water, housing, teaching, all of this. I'm going to say one to parents. Mad, 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 huge props for going to work eight hours, ten hours, sometimes only six, you take a short day. But you come home from work with a paycheck that can buy these things for you. Christ was asked what the greatest commandment was in Matthew chapter 22. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the teacher of the law was like, yeah, pretty self-satisfied. And then Jesus goes, and a second one, the teacher goes, I didn't ask for the second one, I asked for the first. Jesus says, a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Loving your neighbor as yourself. And it's funny, when we go to church and usually we hear that, we're told, you know, how to love our homeless neighbor. Who is your neighbor? The question is asked, and Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. But in church we ask who our neighbor is, and we say everybody, not the guy who lives next door. In this case, and especially with this commandment, I'm going to do the exact opposite. Who is your neighbor? They are the people who are near to you. To love and serve your neighbor, parents, you do it on a scale Ruth and I cannot yet appreciate. And kids in the classroom, they do it on a scale that you do not recognize because you think of yourself as their child, not as their neighbor. Your dearest and most dependent neighbors are the smallest among us. And thank you for loving and serving your neighbors, your kids, as yourselves. And kids, in response to love and serve your neighbor, those who are nearest to you, those near to you are your parents. And how do you love and serve your parents as if they were yourself? Parents have a unique job among all other people. So it's my job to teach, to pass on. That's what the word catechism means. The, in Greek, kata means underneath or down, and echo, just repeating. It is to pass down the echo of generations. I'm passing on. It's my job right now to teach. I'm not keeping y'all alive. I don't support you the other six days a week. Heck, the other 166 hours a week. I am here for just two hours on Sunday. This is inclusive. Like this keep alive thing. Sure, firefighters, EMTs, police officers who do discipline, teachers who also teach, role models like athletes or pop stars, maybe not perfect, 
but they serve as examples because they're always in the public eye. But away from the public eye, your parents do all of these jobs. Their job is big, and it is unique, and it is beyond any one of them. Can someone, who, raise your hand if you have your Bible. Raise your hand if you have a Bible on your phone or tablet. It's fine. Uh, Caleb, will you look up that first bolded verse about halfway down the page on page on that front page on our handout? John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. So, 2,000 years ago, 
in uh, Roman Judea. Uh, did his mom have retirement savings? Did his mom have her own property? Should 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 that? Could she rent out the downstairs of her home as a mother-in-law apartment so that there was someone living there who could give her money? His mom had nothing because women in Roman Judea didn't have property rights. So when Jesus' dad died, there was no one. Jesus was Mary's son. Jesus didn't build up a great mound of wealth. We know, at least before age 30, he was probably a tradesman, carpenter, most likely a stone worker, but, you know, he, he had some skills. He was able to provide for his mom, and when he started preaching, he had a tax collector, some fishermen, um, like guys who had trades and made money, and so uh, we know Judas handled the money bag, so people would give them money. So Jesus at least had some small form of income where he might be able to look after his mom while he was preaching. And then he's dying, and he doesn't have property. And even if he had property, it would go to, like, the first male cousin he had, because Jesus didn't have any kids, and it wouldn't go to his mom. So Jesus' response in that moment is to look at John and says, I love my mom. Take care of her. She's yours now. And John said, I got this. No problem. How do we, especially today, when my mom's we, my dad's pension plus my parents' combined social security is more money than I make in a year, so they're doing okay. So in this era, when our parents have retirement income, when our mothers can have property, how do we honor our parents? How can we follow Jesus' example in this? You can still take care of them. Guess who put up my mom's Christmas tree? Ruth, actually, to be clear. <laughs> yeah. Um, every other Sunday, so today, after service, Ruth and I will go down to her parents' place. We'll spend time with them. And we'll share lunch. Next week, well, next week Ruth and I will be out of town. But if it were a normal weekend, next week we'd be at my mom's place, taking down said Christmas tree. Um, we come and we provide comfort, companionship. When you grow up, and heck, when you hit high school and you're driving, guess what? Your parents still want to see you. It is very easy to hit the point in your life where you're like, I'm independent, I don't need to go back and see my parents. Your parents love and miss you. Go see your parents. Believe me, by the time you hit 30 and you're completely independent in your job, they will be so thankful they don't need to cook for you and do your laundry anymore. But care for your parents. Give them companionship. When they need help, help out. There's this response even before you're dying on a cross where you provide for your parents. So, you're not a professional, you're not a full-grown adult, you're not earning a small income from walking around the Israeli countryside preaching. So today, right now, how can you show that you honor and cherish your parents as gifts of God, as someone whom God has given and more importantly, to recognize them as God's representatives on earth. That box right below is like this note to future self. I'm going to call that homework. I'm serious. In three weeks, when we're back here for February session, I'm going to ask you about your note to your future self. 
It's a chance to talk about it with your parents. What does good parent look like? What does honoring your kids look like? And how do you honor your parents as a parent? That part is for you to really think about. So, we're going to flip over to the next page and just keep digging. So, quick, so, so to jump into this, we'll do a quick review on how we break out the Ten Commandments. So, we talked about this when we first started Confirmation, and I read it earlier. Someone comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what is the great commandment? And Jesus answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind with all your strength, which is in a separate, not in the Matthew citation they're using here, because it's there with all your strength. But, he says it elsewhere. So with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Right? And then, he says, and a second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. On these two depend all the law and the prophets. So we have love God, And two, love others. So, this fourth commandment, honor your father and mother, which one does it fall under? Number two. Number two. I agree. So, 4 through 10, commandments 4 through 10, we call the second table of the law. It's about loving other people. Commandments 1 through 3, which we've studied before, you shall have no other gods, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, and remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. That's about our relationship with God. 4 through 10, gets into our relationship with other people. But here's what's really interesting about commandment number four. Commandment number four is like a bridge between the two. It links five through ten with one through three. And we'll get into this a little bit. So, in the very first commandment, you shall have no other gods. We understand that God is authority. He is God. We are not. We are not eternal. We did not create the heavens and the earth. We cannot, out of nothing, create life. And we cannot create, we cannot send rain. We cannot bring up animals for us to eat out of nothingness, we have to find them and tame them. But when God established the world, if you go all the way back to Genesis, I will read this a little bit. So, on Genesis chapter 1, God creates the heavens and the earth and all that is in them in six days, and on the seventh day he rested, which harkens back to the Sabbath, which was commandment 3. But on the sixth day, Day. God said, this is uh, Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 26, if you want to make a note and highlight this. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Ladies, that means you too, in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. Go back to do what? Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens. So when God creates 
all this physical stuff, who does he put in charge of all the stuff? Who? Humans. Humans. People. And so he creates male and female, and he says, God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, have the sex and lots of babies, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So at the very beginning, he has male and female. As we learn in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, we come to call them Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve at the time are the only people. And God tells them to do what? Have dominion and have what else? Kids. Kids. And he says, have dominion over every living thing that moves on the earth. Again, he's talking to Adam and Eve at this time. Who or what else are living things that will be moving and living on the earth? Those kids, right? So at the beginning, God creates man and woman to have kids and to be leaders of them, to have headship. And male and female, Adam and Eve, are made in whose image? God's. So when God gives us parents, he's giving us a picture of himself. God is our father. What does your father look like? Some of you can look right, right next to you. Some of you, they're not here this morning. What does your father look like? And God says, I look like Adam. God is your parent. He cares for you and provides for you and nourishes you and protects you. And you say, what does God look like? And he says, I look like your mom. Parents serve as God's representatives to us. Which is why this living as examples, if we want to know how to act, how to be godly, your parents have a huge job that is so difficult that they cannot meet perfectly. So, short version, if you want to honor your parents, forgive them, they're not going to be perfect. And because they couldn't be perfect at it, God himself took on flesh and became Jesus to serve as that perfect example, who is the perfect son and makes sure his mother is cared for, and is the perfect provider who feeds 5,000, not just those in his household, who calms the winds and the seas on a stormy night on the Sea of Galilee because he has dominion over the earth. Jesus becomes this perfect picture that God originally intended because your parents are not perfect. And so when we say, love your neighbor, we're going to start with those near to us. We're going to start with parents love your children, children love your parents. And also for your parents' sake and for your own, love your siblings. That's the hardest commandment. <laughs> <laughs> so, when God creates the world, God says, humans, man and woman, Adam and Eve, have dominion over the earth, subdue the earth, and have authority over every living thing, including the children you're going to have, to fill the earth when you are fruitful and multiply, have dominion. So, how does God rule on earth? Through parents. Whom else does God rule through? Parents is, parents is part of 
about it, I 100% agree. But, okay, let me ask you this. Uh, do your parents have people that are in charge of them? Like who? Cat. Like who? Their boss at work. Who else? Authority. Authority. Who's who? Uh, Give me an example. Pastors. Pastors! Cat, your hand was up again. There? No. Oh. 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 My parents, like literally, my parents, like if my grandma told my mom to do something, she'd be like, all right, old man. Right. Oh. Yeah. No, no. Um, I don't have kids yet, but uh, you better believe I'll still be putting up my mom's Christmas tree. And Ruth will be decorating it because I don't have anything that stuff. But Caleb. Kings, presidents, government. The police. Still governmental authorities. Yeah. God rules on earth through people, through all of these different authorities in our lives. So when we say, honor your father and mother, and we remember that God himself is our father, are we saying, honor just those two people. Who are we honoring if we honor our father and mother? Luke. We're also honoring God. We are honoring God. And if we are honoring God, who on earth do we honor? Caleb. Everybody who is what? Old. Ooh, old. Actually, yes, that is actually specific in the long-form answer to the catechism. You are skipping ahead. But not just old. Um, I don't think I'm old, but I guess you're old. Jeez. Well, ouch. Actually, <laughs> just because he's here, I'm going to pick on Luke for a second. This was probably like five to ten, eh, no, like six years ago. I doubt Luke remembers it because he was a little guy at the time. Luke was running around in the narthex downstairs, and I told him and his friends and siblings to settle down. And mm, Luke's like, you're not my dad. And if you know Luke's mom, Danette, wonderful lady, I love her to death, Danette heard this and turned on Luke faster than I could ever even think to and goes, no, he's not, but he's an adult and you respect him. And I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> I was like, thanks, Danette, got this. <clears throat> oh, a uh, pissed off Danette Church is a scary woman. She's like the sweetest, most loving, caring mom to everybody, but don't make her upset. It's true. So true. But we respect not just those who are older. So if I'm driving 80 on the freeway and I get pulled over by a state patrol officer who's fresh out of the state patrol academy and all of 24 years old, seven years younger than me, should I still respect and honor him? Yeah. Why? What is he to me? On a level plane, but he's a cop, so what else is he, Caleb? An authority. Yes! Honoring your father and mother, there's a special relationship you have with your parents. But when we talk about honoring father and mother and recognizing that God is father, we are talking about positions of authority. Does anyone have a dictionary app on their phone? Or, you know, if they don't have an app, the ability to navigate to a dictionary website? Because um, I just realized I don't have a dictionary on my phone, which I consider a shocking failure. Um, Ruth keeps the, the Oxford English Dictionary on her phone because she's responsible. Honor. H-O-N-O-R. 
And, and I want the verb definition, not the noun. What is honor, anyway? Uh, to, hold, to hold in honor or high respect. That's to hold, wait, honor means to hold in honor? That's not a good one. It says verb. Sure. To hold in honor. It's literally uh, to worship, to show courageous regard for. High respect. So it says to hold in honor. Can you scroll up to the noun definition of honor so we know what it means to hold in? In that position? Honesty, fairness, or integrity in one's beliefs and actions. Honesty and integrity. How are you honest, or how do you show integrity to authority? How is the word honor different than love or like?
come back. I said five minutes. It has been five minutes and 37 seconds. Now, if you... We'll, we'll, we'll dig into that table in just a moment. Uh, Zoe. Zoe. Your hands up. What's yeah. more? Okay. I have a very If it's very important, we can't let it wait. What is the very important? So question? you have a no and a yes up there. Yes. And it's for should we honor like how do we like is it for how do we or should we? Uh how. Okay. The how answer is yes, you totally should. Okay. That's the command, right? Honor your father and mother. That means do this thing. But if you go back to the first page at the top. It says the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother, and it says, what does this mean? And the answer to what does this mean says, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise and anger our parents and authorities, but honor, serve, obey, cherish them. So this commandment includes a no, do not despise or anger your parents, and it includes a yes, cherish, serve, obey, honor. So this is just the two sides of the table on the bottom of 47. Do not do this, do do this. So it's a no and a yes. I'm just going to start bulleting examples. I don't know what to ask now. Okay. I don't know what that is.
The yes. Okay. Don't talk back. What should you do instead? Talk front. <laughs> Jason. I actually had one for this. Oh, sure. Uh, don't try to argue with them thinking that you're smart. Because you ain't. Yeah. You <laughs> never are. Yes, I love this. Do not, do not pick and choose your authorities. God has put authorities in your life. Foremost among them are your parents. You don't get to choose your authorities. They are given to you. And they are your parents. That's, that's really good. And it gets into Zoe's question. I've been doing this since 1995. Oh, yes. <laughs> God, like, oh, so, if you're not, if you're not going to talk back, what are you going to do instead? You're going to bargain with them. <laughs> no, that's no bargaining. No bargaining. Well, you could be like, oh, listen. Yeah. Listen. And I'd say that's a great compliment to ignore as well. Rebel. Kat, you said something. You said listen and what? Obey. Obey. So, uh, what should you do instead of disrespecting your parents? Yeah, respect. Respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. -E Find out what it means to your parents. Oh, <laughs> love that. So instead of picking and choosing your authorities, what should you do? How do you honor your parents? Luke? Accepting they're the authority that's been given to you. Ah, accepting they're the authority that's been given to you. What do you, can you condense that to one word? I have a question. Sure. So, what do you have to choose your authorities? Like, one of, one of your authorities? Like, if you have mom and dad and they disagree. You just kind of sit there and like cry because you don't know what to do either. <laughs> yeah. Caleb, Matthew, I know your parents. I know your parents very well. If dad says no, you don't ask mom. And if mom says no, you don't ask dad. I'm not dad. asking about that. I'm talking okay. about like them disagreeing about some, like, something like, yes, he should go through, no, he should go through, yes, they should do this, no, he should do this. Oh, I, I, would, I would submit to you that you don't listen, you, you, don't, you don't hit them against each other. Instead, they talk it out and they present you an answer. And so you can say, you can tell your dad, honestly, mom said it was okay. And you can even tell your dad, mom said it was okay, and can you talk to her about it? Because I just want it clear. Wanting a clear answer is not a bad thing. But putting them against each other, your parents are both their authority. They're both there for your good. And when they make those contradictory decisions, it's because both of them want what's best for you, and they just aren't on the same page. Give them a chance to get on the same page. So instead of, so what's one word for accepting the ones in authority over? one. Submit the very uncomfortable one. The one we hate. And, you know, I'm going to add one more over here. Love your parents. Look at Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross who says, take care of my mom. Take care of your parents. Love them. Serve them. Now, to Zoe's, to, to Zoe's question, what if they ask you to do something that's really messed up? Last page. I gave away my sheet, so I don't have a shortcut for this. Um, wait, 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 are we not going to have a confirmation of that little one? It's love. It's love. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, 
So I we we ran out of sheets, so I lost my last sheet. Um, but I'm going to read you very very shortly from Acts chapter four. Okay. So to set the scene here, Peter and John, two of Jesus, two of, thank you, two of Jesus' disciples, Peter and John, after Jesus' resurrection. So this is Jesus comes back to life. He tells them, "You will be my witnesses. Go and preach the gospel." So Peter and John are going to the temple. This guy uh, is lame. He can't walk. And he's sitting at the gates of the temple because everyone has to go by there. And he calls out to Peter and John. He's like, please, sirs, help me. I just need some money because I can't work a job, so I rely on people giving me handouts. And Peter looks at him, and he says, I, I don't carry any cash, bro. I'm sorry. I only got a card. Um, he says, money I have none, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. And the lame beggar hears the words of Peter, hears the promise of Jesus, and gets up and walks. It is, it is the first miracle we see one of the apostles perform. And then everyone around is like, this guy can't walk. What is going on? This is nuts. And Peter and John stand on the steps. And he's like, hey, hey, listen up. Stop freaking out. Listen to me. And the people turn and listen to Peter and John. And he says, I don't do this by my own authority. I do this by the power of Jesus who is God in the flesh and who rose again to life and calls all men to himself that they may be saved from their sins. And all the priests in the temple get really, really angry. They're like, they can't be doing this. They're undercutting our business. And they arrest Peter and John. So Peter and John are dragged up before the council, before the Sanhedrin, the ruling authorities of Jewish politics in Jerusalem. And they tell Peter and John, don't, like, you haven't done anything wrong. You, you helped a guy walk. That's cool. But don't talk about Jesus. Like, do your miracle stuff. Keep being a good Jew. Don't talk about Jesus. And Peter says, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of y'all and to the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And John, and John said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God himself, you must judge. But us, me and my boy Peter here, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And so they tell them not to talk about Jesus, and they say, we must listen to God rather than men. So Zoe, if an authority in your life asks you to do something messed up, who do you listen to? God. Heart. Because God's in your heart. He's telling you not to do that. So if you're listening to God, listen to your heart. I would not encourage you to listen to your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. Okay. You need a choir? Yeah. Yeah. Are you supposed to be done at 10.30? We started a little bit late. 
But yes, I'll be out here literally in one minute. Okay. Are you doing the opening song or offering? Uh, we're doing our right after confession. Okay. Uh, I'll be done literally in one minute. So. I have people who want yeah. to worship, so they're Gotcha, worship. gotcha. Okay. Seriously. Sure, sure. uh, so, he says we must listen to God rather than men. There are authorities in your life. Your parents are also called to submit to authority. Who is that ultimate authority that all are called to submit to? Where will you find God's will and what God commands? It is not in your heart. If you want to see God's words, read your Bible. If you want to hear him speak, read it out loud. I'm sorry we're a little over time. I love you all. You have homework. We'll see you in three weeks.